Um, your hair looks really cool. How did you, how do you have cool hair during quarantine? It's a direct result of, of pandemic. I, I just It's not that, doing anything? Yeah, so I just let it all go. And do you know how I was trying to be like this, um, this skater boy? So I would, I would You make... had a skater boy face, that's so cool. <laughs> Where are you right now? I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Oh, nice. Yeah. I, I lived there for a quick second as well. Yeah, and originally I'm from Tennessee. That's crazy to grow up in Tennessee, huh? I've never even been to Tennessee. A lot of people want to go there. I think it is alluring, the South, um, and like culturally people are interested. I'm assuming you guys were the one Indian family in Tennessee. There were a lot of Indian immigrants there at my at my time in Nashville, but I'm from like a small town in a more rural setting outside of Nashville. And yeah, we were one of the few. And how did they take to you guys? You know, I felt like I was quite a social like butterfly if I I don't know, that's how I how I handled it. Just like I got in the middle of everything and my dad is quite a social guy too like he was on a, a lot of the boards in town and and a lot of people knew who like dr mani was and who the manis were i think being like yeah very different but also he was like trying to run things it was awesome <laughs> so I, it was it was cool uh, my reputation was preceded by my parents sort of like getting really involved in the community and that's so cool so you guys not yeah, only making in, friends kind of like you guys kind of dominated a little bit, huh? That's interesting. It's kind of, it's really fun. When I, I was, uh, I recently got married and we had the wedding in Nashville and, and a lot of friends coming from like Brooklyn and all over. It was a big wedding and it was in like different, a lot of different places over the course of like three days, big Indian wedding. <laughs> and the parts that took place in Dixon, where I'm from, uh, meant like a 45 minute cab ride from... Nashville and so like some of my Brooklyn friends who were taking that cab ride were like in conversation with the driver being like oh you're going to Dr. Monty's house and it's just like really really personal and really nice it's just like yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing that sounds great yeah and and you grew up in I read you were born in in Taiwan and in California born. Yeah, I, I grew up in a in um, in a suburb called Upland, California. I was one of maybe two uh, Asian kids in my grade school. That kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Very, when we first got here, we moved into my dad's sister's house. So there's a family of eleven people. It was a pretty, you know, classic. Yeah. Year. You had like a lot of cousins and and families around. Cousins grew up with my cousins. Yeah. Yeah, that must have been really nice or was it ultimately like you just wanted your own thing when you're that young i think it's really nice especially mm -hmm. because the moment that you step outside your doors you're in right. like this white america that doesn't really make sense and you it, it, at first you're not really um you don't really process like why you look so differently compared to yeah. everybody. um i don't know if you had that experience but it was for us it was just kind of like crazy i don't know why these kids are blonde and blue eyed like like this doesn't make sense, you know. Oh, that's so. That's interesting because you had such a um, clear world view, like in your home, of what the like the world looks like, yeah. and that was not outside of your door. Very, that's very interesting. Did that result in um, like a a pride in your self, like early on? Honestly, I mean, when you're a kid, all you want to do is just fit in. Yeah. So, yeah. So not, I can't really say that it, uh, that the pride came in so much later. But initially, it was just a lot of shame and just awkwardness and really insecurities about why, you know, I didn't look the same as other people. And also, and what this entire culture was about, well, you know, the, the moment that you get outside of LA, it could be a very non-progressive, non-welcoming place to be mm -hmm. for somebody who looks like us, mm -hmm. to be frank. That provided some of its challenges. I remember... I was trying to be in junior high. I was trying to be like this, um, this skater boy. So I would, I would you make, had a skater boy face. That's so cool. <laughs> it, it was cool up until this one day. I went to school, and this was in the late '80s, early '90s, and you know, Guns and Roses, Anarchy, like that era. And yeah. these guys, all my white skater friends, were like jumping in a circle, huddled 
chanting white power. No. What? <laughs> and, and I just and I just remember going, I don't know what that's about. I know these people don't hate me, but I also know I'm not invited in right now. That's such a weird like juxtaposition of realities. Cause like yeah. you're right there. These are yeah. your friends and you're exactly. you have such a similar actually like a lot of similarities because of yeah. what like with the group you're in and at the same time it's like divided like you are not us it's so weird to think about that in the recent years especially this yeah. year because it just kind of shows in the in the kind of in the present country that we're in you know yeah. our, that our acceptance um, might be conditional absolutely and and feeling like emboldened in your like multiculturalism and and dual identities like i i feel like the language is there there's more language for it now or, or me i'm just growing up and able to like use my own words more about it and, and articulate these kinds of feelings because it, it really is it's so embedded so early on it's it's hard to like pinpoint and it's like it's a very subconscious thing and now we're like very consciously talking about it did you feel um that pride that you were talking about growing up did you feel an indian pride as a kid i did not i'm, I'm sad to say and i think i i'm continually embracing it and and like feeling more pride day by day but it is like uh that sense of being othered and, and being so different um it just it really wormed its way in quite deeply and i wanted i went through my like phase of rejecting my parents culture and like what was inside the house was like this has to stay in here and when i'm outside these doors i am not this <laughs> right. and it it was like i was functioning i was like really functioning outdoors i was on the mm -hmm. on the sports teams I was on the dance team I really loved like performing and putting on costume and like being a bit of a chameleon I think to to survive and and it also it brought me joy because performing brought other people joy like I was able to uh -huh. I had pride in kind of being a class clown and, and a performer but that's how I was sort of dealing with my difference and I I didn't I really didn't realize, like, I, I remember we'd go to temple on Sundays and sometimes, like, Sundays was my very, like, culturally Indian day. <laughs> we grew up um, next to, um, like, a Hindu cultural center, mostly, like, cultivated by South Indians in a large community. So there were, like, um, like, dance and music classes and Sunday school. And, like, it was a very kind of lovely connection you know to my culture and wow. i remember like having to you know we wear our our salvar kummies the clothes you wear to temple and then you get in the car and you're like oh we need to run an errand and you oh we have to go to the mall and it's like but i didn't bring a change of clothes and we have to go to the mall like this yeah. and like wearing yeah the, the patu the, the bindi on the on the forehead and like just being so so wildly like pointably different was was yeah. like sometimes it was a badge of honor and sometimes i was just like oh, no! <laughs> but i i remember that so clearly that's interesting it sounds like you've uh you've always had a knack for performing and it sounds like you have kind of i uh, grew up around it Did, is this something that you've known that you wanted to do your whole life i must have known like very physiologically but i think conceptually i don't intellectually like i had to that wasn't a path really yeah it wasn't quite the accepted path and especially kind of growing up in like a south asian household it's you know it's not security it's not success it's not like engineer doctor lawyer mm -hmm. um i went to school to emerson like with these on paper academics and on paper extracurriculars and I, I actually i turned that into like well i'm going to pursue writing because that seems like the most practical thing yeah. okay. creative application or something but it was really a front you know I, I got involved in the like arts programs or you know what i could without being an art uh, acting major or theater major um, uh -huh. just like auditioned for a lot of things and 
got into comedy groups and was doing like this experimental group. Like it was always about the clubs. I have been like just falling into it quite organically. It still feels weird to say I'm an actor, but I. I... So do you remember a specific moment when, when you thought like, this is it, I'm, I'm actually fully committing and doing this? I've had a few seasons of, of glow under my belt. It, it really elevated me kind of to that level for myself of like, I can have integrity and I, in, in acting and collaborating and in being in this industry, because I, I want to be here. Like the, it took me, it took me a while and I'm, I'm still like making sure that I can like have solid ground on that platform for myself. Cause it's, it's always shifting. We're also in a business of like, you don't know when you're going to get the job. Like the nature of that on top of the nature of like, where do I fit in? Yeah. It seems like you had like a flip of a switch um, in your kind of introduction to acting. Yeah. I had this ridiculous deal with my father in college. I went to UCLA and, and uh, I had started dabbling in acting and, and done, you know, been on stage a little bit, started, kind of doing the co-star thing and TV a little bit. And I remember just going, I think I really want to give this a shot and I wanted to quit college. And you know, in the Asian family, oh, that's not on the menu. I made a deal with my dad that um, I, it, I would- That's it. really scary. Good, congratulations. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm still living it down today. But <laughs> I would finish under my majors, which is math and econ with a minor in computer science, if after college, you would let me do whatever I wanted. And we, wow. we stuck on it. And I wow. grudgingly finished. I remember my graduation, I didn't even walk because I didn't care about it. Like that's how little I did it for myself. Wow. So I went five years, I finished. But then uh, shortly after college, I, I landed a show in New York and I did All My Children. So that, okay. would, that took me to New York and it was, it was a crazy time. A lot of changes back then i remember i was just entering as the late and great chadwick boseman was leaving michael b jordan came and took his spot and it was just like a really crazy time to be a young actor in new york this is probably 2002 but it's crazy you wow. know yeah those are certainly fun times and it created a, a love affair that i still have with new york you know so yeah that's that's really cool it is cool to be a working actor in new york so when you do kind of have a little bit of a breather with that and you can work and live not just like mm -hmm. work to live live to work it's like exactly. it's a good a good time to be in New York. When you left college, you went straight to New York in, in pursuit of everything, or were you trying to still figure things out? You mentioned you still work with some of the same people from college. It sounds like yeah. a job, like comedy. Yeah, it was like weirdo sketch comedy, a um, lot of character and costume and like talent show energy. Like we just loved making each other laugh. Yeah. And that kind of fit into like the variety show thing like some of us were stand up some of us would like make videos and we would screen those some of us would do character stuff and like write sketches it just was its own kind of little production engine because we all wanted to do everything yeah that was the pursuit to just make shows in new york live shows specifically there was there was such a love for live performance in my life um and did you have a theater in New York that you constant that you regularly? Those yeah, up? I tried to like infiltrate the improv comedy scene at UCB and and like the Magnet, and I I, I felt like I yeah it, it was like a a bit of a conflicted relationship with that uh, yeah. with like the UCB world. I was very much in love with it, but also felt very much like I am not this, but I want to be this, but I but I'm not this. So there was like, and I was I was there when they were like there are no women or brown people <laughs> on these teams. Like, it, so I felt the, like the weight of being the only like brown woman in classes and a lot of these like teams and stuff. So I was, I think uh, that informed a lot of why I didn't feel like I belong there. But yeah. at the time I wasn't quite saying that out loud. I, I sort of like phased out of it with like love and admiration and like went my own way. And tried to like just keep making stuff. And so the three best girlfriends and I, Eleanor and Tally and myself, formed this comedic group uh -huh. called Cocoon Central Dance Team. And it uh -huh. was like 
like choreographing dances that were very silly. Like we took them very seriously, which is why they were very absurd. Because <laughs> we're grown women dancing to like Mariah Carey as if we were 14 in our bedrooms. Yeah. And like, you know, living in that fantasy. Yeah. And uh, that sort of like was a range of theatrical possibilities for me. There was, it was like physical comedy. It was like taking these like small moments very seriously and these big moments very seriously to have like a whole palette of comedy that I was interested in. Yeah. Um, in performing that led me to acting. So tell me about Turn Down for What? Yeah. Because that was that birth out of one of these things or did you audition for that? Did you know how, how did that? Yeah. That those directors come from that very, um, that pod of people that I met at Emerson college. No so way. yeah, I know Dan uh -huh. Kwan and, and Daniel Shiner from Emerson. Er, Daniel Shiner a little more closely cause we were on like the same comedy. We were in the same comedy group together and we had just like formed this very silly language of like dancing together at, at parties or like it, it, you know, fits in very well with my comedic dance group. Um, there's just so much joy that comes from the absurdity of the body um, and throwing it around. I, that, that opportunity came through them and they were just sort of like, will you come do this thing? And I didn't really know what I was getting into, but well, I was just was like, this conversation? absolutely. It's yeah, like a text message of like, hey, are you, can you like come to LA next week? <laughs> Would you, will you be in a Lil John music video? And I was just like, yeah. I'm gonna confess, I, I saw it for the first time last night and I sat my girlfriend down and I made her watch it. It's so brilliant and so amazing and you guys are so Thank fearless you. in it and it's so impressive. Like I wanna, like what's more difficult for you? Is something like that or your most involved like wrestling scene from GLOW? Oh man, the turn down for what music video was like so easy. <laughs> was it really? I mean, it's like, I love being a freak dancer. <laughs> That's great. If anything, I hope I did it justice because they, they really go to like the nth degree with their jokes and their visuals and their comedy. It's just, yeah. it's admirable. And I, I want to like match them and meet them. So I, I feel like the wrestling, they're very connected. The, the like larger than life kind of yeah. persona and, and the physical, like the body confidence, I'm, I'm like, I feel more comfortable there than like an acting scene, honestly. Like sometimes we joke on set on GLOW, we'd forget how to act. Like we would be in scenes cause we spend like four, we would spend like four weeks training. When production starts, it's like, we're doing scene work, not necessarily the wrestling, which just trying to get, we're trying to get back into that and trying to set up where we're gonna go for the season. So that's why we train, but like those first weeks we're just like, how do we act again? <laughs> like, what <is> the, <laughs> like, this feels harder than wrestling. Can I ask you about Nocturne? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, how did you like feel when you, when you booked that role? Uh, I actually had to choose between doing that and, and a show in Prague. Zoo, the writer director, I thought she wrote a really interesting script. She had a couple of short films that I saw that I thought were uh, stylistically very interesting and, and um, she seemed like somebody I would want to work with him. I, I think in, in the end this role was meatier than the other one in Prague. I feel like I had a similar uh, sort of entryway into it. Like it was really about connecting with the directors for me as to what movie we were making. I'm wondering, that conversation with Sue, the writer, what were some of the like most exciting elements of that conversation that got you like, okay, this is, I'm gonna do this. For me, it was mostly about what the entire thing was about. Ultimately, this kind of, um, it's kind of suffering that I think we all know in pursuit of something creative that we really love. And in particular, this character had a, um, kind of had a dark backbone because to me he was ultimately the story of somebody who who failed who mm -hmm. who strove for the world stage but never achieved that so it was almost a story of dreams deferred you know and and I thought there was something really interesting in that and how much suffering that could cause people and being in this business as long as I have I've certainly seen people lose their minds I've seen people really suffer I've gone through ups and downs on my own and I remember I was just on the heels of 
turning 40 and I thought this was something I really wanted to do. And we felt like we were very much speaking the same language from, from the get go. And she seemed yeah. like really receptive of certain ideas that I had. And, and, uh, and I thought she was very um, specific and, and particular in a very challenging way. It's really cool that these stories are, they seem to be succeeding because they just like haven't been done before in a way, you know, like we haven't seen them before. Yeah, and you're, you're spot on about that. I think about that all the time when you take on something. You, most people don't talk about that cultural burden because you're, you're yeah. talking about something so specific and you want to treat it right and, and talk about these things in, in a way that's interesting and cinematic and, and thematic. That's These things in your movie, do you think the ideas will resonate with a large Indian audience slash Indian American audience? That's the big question <laughs> i think so i i mean amazon's really proud of it um blumhouse is proud of it and and priyanka chopra jonas is proud of it like there are a lot of people on the on the inside of the industry that i feel are like elevating this in a way that's like oh okay and the response from like international press has been positive just that it is it's reaching cross-culturally and it's both really specific and also totally universal and that it's like featuring a south asian cast which is like an all south asian cast which is which is awesome so going into it i was really trying to hold on to the small and hold on to the specifics and then the response has been like it's bigger than that and it's been positive so that's great did you guys actually shoot in new orleans we did you did had you been there or spent time there before I had been there once before for a film festival. How'd you like it? How'd you like the city? Perfect for like a haunting movie, right? <laughs> it's like the house itself and like the neighborhoods and these like big old trees and these big porches. Like it really created this sort of mystical and superstitious feeling to, to set. Like dealing with superstition as our movie does so i was like very thrilled to take on like whatever fun ghosts that was going to bring and it's a, like all the voodoo culture and everything that you're surrounded by and all the yeah and like the above ground cemeteries are very intense over there are you yeah. uh, are you a pretty superstitious person yourself i don't even realize i am like my, my husband actually brings it up a lot and i'm like oh i didn't i've just always done it that way because if you do it this way then that's really bad why i don't know it's just bad <laughs> like I, I think i have like some of that ingrained in me it's my kind of way into like the horror genre it is like i think it's brilliant that our movie sort of put the two on top of each other because it's like that feeling of not knowing the unknown but like you respect it but you're afraid of it but also like you want to peek around the corner and see if anyone is really going to kill you <laughs> like it, it's this play of like i don't know you like to be scared i like to test fate a little bit by doing a ritual or not you know yeah that's interesting years ago i was uh, i was doing this tiny little horror film in new orleans <clears throat> and um, my buddy and I were, were both in the movie and in the middle of the night at three in the morning, our beds would just like shake side to side. Uh, we were very scared and it worked for the movie, but it was, yeah, it's a weird town, but I love it. Yeah. Where was your movie shot? Uh, a little bit in the French Quarter, a little bit uh, in the outskirts, uh, Harvey, mm -hmm. right across the water over there. Mm -hmm. And then in the northern part too. It was, it was all over, but it was when we were staying in Harvey, Louisiana, that stuff started getting a little bit weird. And It's so cool that you're doing what you're doing. I, I want to hear more. And yeah, likewise. And, you know, I feel like I've gotten to know your work in a very short amount of time, and it's, I'm such a big fan. Thank you.